and gentlemen, welcome to the Geological Society of London. And this is the fifth Society London lecture um, in 2015, entitled Fossiled Mud, A Jurassic Adventure. Um, my name is Richard Forty, and I was actually gave the very first of these London lectures when I was president of the Society in its bicentenary year in 2007. At that time, they were sponsored by Shell, uh, but they proved so popular that uh, not only... Uh, to start with, we just gave one lecture, but now they're so popular that the speaker has to volunteer or is, a, is requested to volunteer to give the same talk on two occasions on the same day, so, uh, uh, which is what's happening today. So we're very grateful to Neville for agreeing this. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Neville Hollingworth from the University of Birmingham. Um, Neville has spent 25 years, or more than 25 years, wallowing around in ancient mud. And mud is a particular theme for the Geological Society this year. And today, he's going to introduce you to the Middle Jurassic of North Wiltshire and South Gloucestershire, where you can find uh, excellently and abundantly excellent and abundantly fossiliferous exposures of the Oxford clay. And he's just given me an ammonite, my very own, which is almost an old friend, because I was ref reflecting that this was one of the first fossils I ever collected when I was still a schoolboy. Of course, I became a professional paleontologist later on, thanks to these sorts of discoveries. But these outcrops have provided Neville with an unrivaled opportunity to collect lots of fossils, some of which are not found on equivalent coastal exposures. Neville studied geology at Newcastle University, did his PhD at the University of Durham. He was a research fellow at the Open University, and then went on to pursue a career in program management. That was also at the OU, I guess, was it? Uh, no, it was the Research Council. Oh, yeah. particularly at the Research yeah. Councils, so, which is the last 15 years, really, if you like. Uh, his primary earth science interests include paleobiology, ancient environments, and climate change. He's an authority on British Jurassic stratigraphy and marine faunas, and he's published many papers, mostly in paleobiology and stratigraphy, as well as a number of field guides to world-famous fossiliferous sequences. And he currently conducts collaborative research with colleagues at the University of Birmingham, where he is an honorary research associate. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Neville Hollingworth. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, good evening. And uh, I'm going to give you um, a, a kind of a geological sort of adventure uh, presentation, a talk tonight. It's more linked to what I did in terms of my uh, research and then the sites that I work on in North Wiltshire and South Gloucestershire. I was very fortunate that when I uh, moved to Swindon and started working for the research councils that I was placed in an area that is of great geological interest. And by that, the area to the north of Swindon, between Swindon and Sirencester, uh, before we get into the Cotswolds, there is a, a lot of uh, working gravel pits that expose underneath the Ice Age gravels the uh, Jurassic beds that contain this incredible rich fossil fauna. But before I get into the details of that, um, just to sort of uh, go into the world of um, Jurassic mud, um, I'm sure all of you will recognise this picture. Uh, this is uh, Black Ven down in Dorset. This was a picture taken a few weeks ago, I think it was the bank holiday weekend. And as you can see, there's a fabulous uh, section here with uh, the Black Ven Marls and the Lower Liassic mudstones above. There's a stone barrow in Golden Cap. And this is where, if anybody thinks about fossils and mud, this is the place to go because this is the location <coughs> that produced such an incredible and diverse array of fossils and still does today. And it's where people get inspired and interested. I did from an early age. I think I was about... Um, 11, and I got a bus from Yeovil where I used to live, and uh, I went down to this site here and uh, found my very first pyrite ammonite. And from then, I was completely hooked. I thought, this is what I want to be. I want to be a paleontologist when I get a little bit older. And even today, it's really popular. 
And so this is the classic location where you would think you would find lots of amazing fossils, and you still can, providing the storms have washed things out. But inland, there are locations that produce fossils that are almost equally abundant, and in some places even more than you find on the Dorset coast, this world-famous Jurassic uh, heritage site. And by that, through uh, the creation of temporary exposures through sand and gravel extraction, which um, reveals these um, horizons which are not seen on the Dorset coast, and uh, generally, um, are, when they are exposed, are incredibly rich. And so that's what I'll do. So what I'm going to take you through, really, is a, a little bit of paleogeography, um, sort of muddy geo-delight geo sites, as I call them. So there's some case studies or stories. There's a tale of saw on the sunken sauropod, quenny digging, and that's something that uh, when Richard held up the ammonite, these are quennies, quenstatoceros, these are pyrite ammonites from the Oxford clay. And I'll tell you a little bit about the quenny digging experiences. Um, oops, let's go back one. Um, Emily's ammonite, and that just goes to show that anyone at any age can find something incredible. And that caught the uh, national and international press. And um, there's a story about that. Amelia's vertebrae, Ice Age mud. So I'm going to move up the geological column and talk a little bit about the um, Pleistocene because in the Cotswold Water Park, the Jurassic clays and mudstones are overlain by uh, river terrace gravels from the River Thames. And um, they produce a lot of uh, vertebrate fossils. So, and, and this one was found in mud. A mystery ammonite, which is a story which is amusing. And then um, a, a kind of cautionary tale about mammoth tusks, uh, which was also one that was found in mud. But there's a, a little bit of caution there. And then something to finish off on mass extinction, which does not involve mud at all. So anyway, just to put you into a paleogeographic perspective, this is the uh, late Jurassic. And the... Um, map here shows the position of the relevant con continents, the Gondwana, Laurasia, this uh, sort of, um, sort of north-east uh, sort of area, northwest, um, got Siberia and China, and then the Tethys Ocean, which um, was a circum-equatorial um, ocean. Notice there are no ice caps at all, and Britain was here about 30 degrees north of the equator, and a lot of sediment coming into a shallow trop shallow sea, mostly, through, through the Jurassic. And there were some periods when there was um, shallower water conditions, but lots and lots of terrigenous mud sediment coming in and filling up basins uh, in, in and around the UK and North Sea. And then down to the south is really deep ocean. And the mud there is not so good for finding lots of lovely fossils. So Britain was well placed. So there we go, lots of Jurassic mud at this particular location. And so, right, okay, I come from Swindon, okay? And I don't know if anybody's ever been to Swindon. Uh, I wouldn't say a great deal about it, other than it's got great ways of getting out of it. But uh, I thought this is the best picture I've seen of Swindon, which was 150 million years ago. And um, for those of you who do know Swindon, this is the Oasis Leisure Centre, okay? But uh, I wouldn't go in the sea. Um, obviously, the marine life at the time was somewhat... Um, uh, well, potentially voracious, but then again, um, I'm sure it would have been a wonderful sight. So a lovely, warm, shallow, tropical sea. And that's the real sort of story I'm going to talk about. The first part of my talk is about what fossils and amazing finds have come out of these um, sediments that were deposited during better times in the Jurassic. And just to put this into a slightly better perspective, here we are, 30 degrees or so north of, north of the equator during the Jurassic. And uh, there's Britain here. And then you can see most of it was covered by the shallow sea. And there's a few land masses, which I'll mention a bit later. That's the London Brabant um, land mass, uh, sort of northeast England, Scotland, bit of Ireland. And then this lovely shallow sea. So it was a seaway between the Boreal Sea to the north and the Tethian Ocean to the south. And lots and lots of wonderful marine animals were living in this lovely shallow sea at the time. So let's move to the geographical area that I'm going to talk about. Um, this... Uh, is um, uh, a map showing the main geological units uh, from the Hampshire Basin. So the area I'm going to talk about is up here. This is the Thames Vale, or the Upper Thames Valley, north of the Marlborough Downs. That's the Chalk Escarpment. And um, as you can see, the, to the sort of northwest, you've got the Cotswold uh, limestones. These are the um, sort of classic oolites you see. And then 
the vale that floors a valley um, south of the Cotswolds. I don't know if any of you have ever travelled from um, Sirencester to Swindon and south to the M4. If you um, drive along the A419, that takes you um, across this flat vale, which is mainly underlain by these Ice Age gravels, as I mentioned, have been exploited for gravel. And then you go up the, Cots uh, go up the escarpment onto the Corallian and then the higher units and the chalk eventually. But most of the Jurassic beds, these um, middle and upper Jurassic beds, this clay, hence mud, the Oxford and um, Callaway's beds, are very soft, they're very um, easily weathered, and so they don't naturally form um, uh, elevated topography. So the River Thames has exploited this uh, valley, and that's where it is. And of course, uh, it's all overlain by these terrace gravels. So most of the Kellaway's beds and the Oxford clay, middle uh, to upper Jurassic in age, are completely covered. But the interesting thing is that North Wiltshire and certainly South Gloucestershire, where there were exposures in the past in little quarries and pits where they were exposed, were incredibly rich and provided an amazing and abundant diverse suite of fossils that have furnished many a monograph and geological <coughs> publication. Um, these beds um, specifically that I'm going to talk about are not generally well exposed on the Dorset coast. So just going a little bit closer into the water park, as I mentioned, this is the kind of what you'll see if you've got a map. This is a map taken from the Cotswold Water Park Trust publication. And it just shows you the number of lakes there are. Now, these were all once um, gravel pits, and they've been abandoned. So the ones in blue are all um, worked out gravel pits. The yellow ones here are currently working, or most of them are. And this is the A419. This is the north-south road connecting the M5 and the M4 to the south. Now, most of the gravel pits that were worked started here and worked towards the east, and these were operational in the 1920s, 30s, about 50-year history. And back in those days, most of those pits were what was known as wet dug. That is, they dug the gravel with a dragline excavator, stacked the gravel, the water drained out, and then it was processed. But they never exposed anything below uh, the, the gravel, mainly because the water table was quite high. So <coughs> groundwater was only about a metre or so beneath the working surface of where they were digging. So... That meant that there was no natural exposures, exposures for the underlying solid geology. It was only with the advent of um, uh, diesel and electric pumps in the 70s and 80s that these sites started to become dry dug. So they actually drain the water from the, the sites. And in doing so, they have to dig through the gravel down to the underlying solid geology and dig drainage ditches and sumps to put the pumps in. So you end up with temporary exposures of the underlying sediments, the rocks, the clay, whatever's there. So this area um, now, as they progress eastwards, and this area here is yet to be developed, that's the eastern water park, um, there are hundreds of lakes. And by the time all of these sites have been exploited and finished, the, um, there will be more lakes than the Norfolk Broads. This will have a much larger um, surface area of water than the Norfolk Broads. So that just goes to show how big this will be when it's all completed in about 30-odd years' time. But that will furnish lots and lots of temporary exposures of the underlying uh, Jurassic beds for um, paleontologists from... Uh, well, certainly see me out for certain. Um, now, um, in terms of the stratigraphy, I'm going to talk about the Kellaway's formation which is about 163 million years old, it's 5 to 10 metres thick, sands and clay and mud. And then this one here, the Oxford clay formation, which is about 90 metres thick. So that provides the largest surface area of exposure underneath these Ice Age gravels. The Cornbrash limestone, that forms a ridge to the north of the Cotswold Water Park, and it's so named because when it um, weathers... Uh, at surface, it produces a really light, brashy soil, which is good for growing corn, hence the name corn brash. It's got some nice ammonites in it, but uh, it's not mud, so I'll concentrate on the Kellaways and the Oxford clay. And the Oxford clay um, forms an outcrop that um, stretches from Dorset all the way up to Yorkshire, or Lincolnshire and into Yorkshire. And the area I'm going to talk about is roughly in this area here, so that's the bit uh, that's in North Wiltshire and South Gloucestershire. 
Um, the exposures on the Dorset coast are only limited to a few sections. Now, I don't know if any of you have been down to South Dorset. The classic site is Tidmore Point on the Fleet Lagoon, but that is um, not brilliantly exposed because it's slumped. Redcliffe Point and a few other locations. And then there were lots of working brick pits in the Midlands that have now closed. So these sites in the Cotswold Water Park are pivotal in that they span the boundary between two different types of sedimentary regime. And the Wessex Basin is this area, and then you've got the East Midlands Shelf, which had that landmass, as I showed earlier. But um, that's why there's some incredible material that's come out of the Cotswold Water Park. Now, don't worry about the details here, but this is Highworth in Wiltshire. This is the Oxford clay, as I mentioned. This 90-metre thick sequence of clays, and it forms the floor of the Upper Thames Valley. So this pink stuff here is these Ice Age gravels that I talked about earlier. And these form a sort of flat plain. There's two or three terraces, and the River Thames flows sort of an easterly direction. And this is the Cornbrash Ridge to the north, marked by this sort of orange material. So the Oxford clay is the predominant unit that the River Thames flows over, and where the gravels have been deposited on top. So, muddy geodelite sites. Now, I'll just take you through a couple of locations that uh, uh, I've worked on. And there's some very happy fossil collectors here sitting on a big pile of mud. And you might notice that one of the prerequisites you might need, notice all their wellies are mud, very muddy, and that's because these sites are dewatered. That is, there's an electric pump, they, t they drain the water from the gravel, and so um, they're very susceptible to heavy rainfall or flooding events. So... Um, these sections generally are only available over a very short period of time and then you can get in, do the collecting and then they're flooded. Most of the sites end up being returned to lakes after they've been restored. And they, um, the, so you get a, a sort of time-limited opportunity to actually collect fossils of which the Oxford clay is one of the richest uh, units to, to uh, work in. Um, this... Um, <laughs> This, is one, this was a remarkable find. It's Lala. I found, found it in a, in a skip when I went to a site called Cong Gravel, which is near Fairford. And the reason I'm um, mentioning this one is because this site um, is actually one of the... Is, is the only site in the UK that exposes a horizon in the Oxford clay that contains um, nodules, concretions, mud, mud concretions, that are packed full of beautifully preserved, uncrushed ammonite fossils. And this uh, site um, is fortunate because what they do is when they dig the gravel, they dig down to the base of the gravel with face shovels, uh, excavators. They process the gravel by tipping it into a giant hopper, and the hopper vibrates. And anything that's bigger than a few centimetres drops off the end of the hopper, and they make a big pile of it. And this is called a reject pile. And I don't know if any of you have got keen eyes, but you see here, there's a, an ammonite here. This is a rare ammonite called Rhinechia. But these nodules, these lumps of clay that have hardened, are from a horizon in the Oxford clay called the Jason Zone and contains a really beautiful ammonite. Now, every single one of these concretions, some of them are over a metre across, contains those ammonites, these cosmosorous Jasons. And they're extremely abundant and beautifully preserved, and this is the only place that you can actually find them. And this site is going to be turned into a lake eventually, and they're going to build very expensive, multi-millionaire um, houses around the outside of it. But at the moment, it is the most incredible rich site that I've collected in for many, many years. But the fossils... So um, the team of us spent a few days working our, working our way through these concretions, splitting them down, and to expose the fossils that were found here. As I say, it's a time-limited site, and this is what we found. And as you can see... Beautifully preserved ammonites with their mother of pearl shells. You see, this is a cosmosorus here with its iridescent nacre. Here's one there, uncrushed. We found um, both adults, mature ammonites, macroconchs, females, um, microconchs, inferred males, um, belemnite phragmacones, all sorts of things. So they were rapidly buried. Um, they, they were preserved um, in this mud that hardened to form these concretions very early on, so they're not crushed. And they've still got their original mother of pearl, their aragonite shells. And they're aesthetically beautiful. They really are quite incredible. And this one's actually being prepared. And some of them are over a metre across and contain several hundred ammonites. And they um, are so unique. The only other place they came from um, was uh, 
a working clay pit which closed in the 1930s or 40s called Bothenhampton Brick Pit, which is near Bridport in Dorset. But this site at Fairford produced several hundred of these amazing concretions with these beautiful ammonites in. Another site which um, is nearby, and just to say a little bit about what happens, is that these gravel pits, once they've removed or dug out all the gravel, what they tend to do now with um, planning uh, requirements is they have to landscape them because they have to restore the the banks so they've got a gentle incline, stop um, people falling into the lakes generally um, afterwards and they make them safer. And so they have to restore them. And in doing so, what they do is they um, bulldoze the clay up the sides of the pit uh, or whatever's underneath. And this is uh, Kellaway's beds and and Oxford clay all mixed up. And... What um, we do is we take a watching brief. So if you get a chance to go in while they're doing this restoration work, um, this is a D6 bulldozer. And sometimes uh, for a fiver or a bottle of wine, you can get the, uh, the, ex- the, the bulldozer driver to um, uh, sort of excavate and push clay up while you watch. And anything that comes out, then you can collect it. And what did we find? Well, the preservation of these fossils from the Kellaway's beds at this particular site, Latin Quarry in Wiltshire, is awesome. This is a sigiloceros with its, uh, it's uncrushed with a, uh, this sort of lovely amber calcite inner worlds, and that's the outer world, the body chamber, this sort of pyrite sheen, uncrushed. Um, sometimes the, uh, if you shine a light through them, it's translucent, and you can actually see the suture lines, which is remarkable. And they were very abundant and beautifully preserved. Here's a, another example of another ammonite, Keplerites from the Kellaway's formation. They, they come out of a mudstone concretion, so it's um, well preserved. And also, um, these are the classics. Um, this is a Cadoceros. They are beautiful ammonites. They really are lovely. One of my favourite ammonites, in fact. And you can see it's got this lovely um, sort of uh, the sutures are uh, picked out because they've still got aragonite, but uh, they've been um, replaced by this lovely amber coloured calcite. And this ammonite was exactly as it is found. Nothing has been done to this. This fell out of a concretion, mainly because the aragonite shell had been uh, dissolved away, and basically, when you hit the concretion, they fall out literally into your hand. And there's no denying it, that's exactly what they look like. They're amazing. And they reveal a beautiful detail of these, these amazing ammonites. And better preserved than anything on the Dorset coast, but in terms of abundance incredibly ri- abundant in terms of numbers and some of these concretions are a metre across contain sort of five or six beautiful cadoceros ammonites. In addition from the Oxford clay we found some rather fine specimens of uh, fishes and this is a skull of a caturus from the lower Oxford clay uncrushed again in a concretion there's the lower jaw, there's the upper jaw, the palatal surface, there's the orbit here with the gill cover here and in the, the back of the skull, um, when you broke away some of the bone material, there's some phosphatic material, which suggests that there may be some soft tissue preservation. And this, amongst other specimens that were found at Latin Quarry, will furnish potential for future re- research on soft part preservation in some rather rare uh, Middle Jurassic Colovian fish. And they do look like fish. That looks just like it died. And... They are rather remarkable, and they occur in this one level where they get these beautifully uncrushed, um, preserved ammonites. But in addition, you also find other things at these sites. We found a few bones of Leedzichthys, which is a large um, cartilaginous um, planktivore that lived in the um, Oxford clay seas. Uh, Marine crocodiles, Metriorhynchus, plesiosaurs, and this is what I really want to find, um, a pliosaur. It would be... An absolute brilliant um, find if we found one of these. I found a few bones and bits of teeth, but never a whole one. So that's uh, one's ambition in life. And you never know, in the Cotswold Water Park, a future gravel pit might uncover one of these specimens. Now, um, one of the things that um, uh, happens to these pits afterwards when they flood, um, after they've been restored, because the groundwater levels just um, creep up again, is that you can actually dive for fossils. And if you've got scuba equipment, you can actually go back in to the lakes and find fossils on the lakes, on the floor of these lakes, um, because as the water level rises, it erodes the banks of clay that have been used in landscaping and create little uh, sort of submarine strand lines. And so um, uh, what I've done is I've dived. But unfortunately, after a few years, this is what happens. 
and um, they get um, colonised by aquatic weed. And unfortunately, in amongst this lot, you get pike, and they are a bit um, frightening. And to make matters more frightening, on one of the lakes, I uh, came across an American catfish, which was about one and a half metres long, and it frightened the life out of me. I really did think that was it. And um, I was wearing a dry suit at the time, and I won't tell you what I did in it. But anyway, <laughs> I wasn't very popular when I got home. So there we go. Um, now, some tales. Um, this one is um, a remarkable discovery that was made uh, at a site, Colm Gravel, that I mentioned earlier. This is the femur of a Cetisauriscus, which is a terrestrial, land-living sauropod. And this was found in the Oxford clay, so finding terrestrial vertebrate in the Oxford clay. And this was found um, about five, six years ago in a pit that was being restored. And what happened was, uh, was down on the floor of the quarry, um, there was a machine digging a trench, and as they were excavating through the Oxford clay to bulldoze it up the sides, he clipped the end of this bone here. In fact, he broke it completely in half. And that's all I saw. And I saw the rest of uh, the, the, the femur, bits of it, and it was in bits. And I thought, yay, I've found a pliosaur. Brilliant. This is brilliant. Absolutely amazing. But as I sort of got more and more of the material out of the ground, I suddenly realised that uh, it wasn't and it was something different. And when it, got, when it was finally pieced together, it turned out to be this uh, sauropod dinosaur femur, which um, is probably the most complete one of this particular species ever found in the middle Jurassic of the UK. Um, it's currently in the Lapworth Museum in Birmingham. And this is what Cetosauriscus looked like. Now, I've called it all once upon a time in the east. <clears throat> the reason for that is simple, because the only land masses that were nearby at the time during um, the m Middle Jurassic, the Clovian um, seaways, um, these dinosaurs probably um, lived in groups on the, uh, the sort of lowland, sort of marshy vegetation. And um, one, uh, so at some point, a carcass of one of these dinosaurs died, got washed out into the Colovian Sea, the Oxford Clay Sea, floated out for some distance, and its leg fell off, dropped off, sort of plummeted down to the seabed, and embedded itself in the soft, soupy sediment of the Oxford Clay Sea floor. And <clears throat> the reason I know it was vertically embedded, because when the, this guy was digging the trench, the, 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 the actual femur was like a tree trunk. It was vertical. It had gone through several layers of sediment. And the top of the femur was encrusted by um, oysters and worms, so it stuck up above the mud. So it formed a little um, hard ground. So it obviously dropped straight out of a carcass and then plummeted to the seabed. Sadly, there was no other bone material found, just this one femur, so the rest of the carcass must have drifted on. So um, if it found a complete sauropod, that would have been awesome. But... Uh, Unfortunately, as I said, it was in lots of pieces, so I had to get it professionally restored, and in doing so, they had to drill a hole into the middle of the femur and put these stainless steel rods. It's like pinning a broken leg, basically. And so um, it was professionally restored, and that was just before it was finished, and this is the finished item, the restored leg. It's about 1.4 metres long as a distal end of the femur, and... Um, you can see that there's a steel pin running through the middle of it. Now, this is currently uh, at the Lapworth Museum in Birmingham, and it's um, going to go on display when they've refurbished and enhanced their displays because they just received some uh, funding to completely replenish and upgrade what they've got there, and this will form uh, an exhibit. So if you want to go and see it, go to the Lapworth Museum, and uh, you'll see it in all its glory. And that's the bone. That's where it came from. And... Uh, it belonged to a Cetosauriscus, which is a middle Jurassic sauropod dinosaur. It was um, about 6.1 metres long, 50 metres, sorry, 6.1 metres high, 50 metres long, weighed about 9,000 kilograms, and so it's pretty big. Can you imagine if you found the rest of it, though? That would have been pretty amazing, but <laughs> never mind. These things happen. The rest of it, missing, presumed, eaten, but there we go. And that's probably what it looked like. It's quite a good reconstruction, uh, courtesy of the Natural History Museum. So, quenny digging. Well, these are quennies, um, pirate ammonites. I'll tell you what, I'll just pass one on. Yeah, I can pass it round. Here we go. On quenny, pass it round. And these um, come from a site, uh, Marston Maisie in North Wiltshire. And again, as I mentioned, in these working gravel pits, uh, you, you have to get 
fresh exposure beneath the, the gravel. So what you do is you employ one of these things. It's a 360 excavator. And uh, again, fiver or a bottle of decent wine from Asda will do it. And um, they sort of remove the overburden of gravel down to this beautifully fresh Oxford clay. And then you get a few friends with spades and then you dig them up. And the great thing about the Oxford clay, uh, the, the, the sort of middle and upper Oxford clay or the Weymouth member, is that it's, uh, it's very easy to dig. And it's like cutting cheese with a knife. And with a spade, you can just take thin <laughs> slices of clay and anything that's hard you hit is usually a pyrite ammonites. And these ammonites I've got here, um, you can find a hundred or so in a couple of hours. And so abundant, they're so abundant that you, um, you could fill a bucket in a day. And so we, we got this thing called a quenny bucket. So you, th you throw these ammonites in. The, 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 the name is Quenstatosaurus henrici, or, and then Quenstatosaurus lambati. They're really, really common. Um, in fact, um, what, um, what we did was um, uh, I, I was involved in um, uh, sponsoring an exhibition at the uh, Cheltenham Science Festival last week, and we had a Jurassic sand pit. So what we did was we collected these ammonites and took them to the science festival, put them in the sand pit so uh, people could excavate their own fossil from Jurassic, Jurassic sand. And I think we put several hundred of these. In fact, several thousand of these went into the sand pit. Very popular. The cautionary tale about pyrite is it doesn't last forever. So, um, but uh, really, really lovely things to find. And they've got their, their aragonite shells preserved. And um, the one thing, though, about collecting in gravel pits is water. And it's the biggest problem. And it gets really muddy when it rains. And, of course, when you've got an excavator that clears a section... It's usually below the, the level of the ditches where the water's been drained away. So every time it rains, it floods what you've been digging. So you have to be a bit creative. So you can have fun making dams of mud, and then you can excavate ahead of it. And hopefully it won't rain again, so it floods what you've already dug. And then I discovered another use for the uh, Oxford clay mud. Um, it makes a brilliant sunscreen or um, makes you younger. I'm 75, by the way. Um, <laughs> So um, if anybody's interested in um, uh, the sort of therapeutic qualities of the Oxford clay, um, there's living proof that it does work. Um, the only problem is that it's damn difficult to get off, as I found. <laughs> so uh, it takes more than just a few showers. And um, the other great thing is, of course, um, where, where the excavations uh, take place. Um, there's uh, my, my partner here. She just uh, uncovered a nodule with a big ammonite called uh, a called um, Rhinechia odysseus is a perisphinctid, but I'll, there's a story about another one like this that was found, and this was only found a couple of weeks ago at a site, it's Marston Maisie, in, um, near Fairford. And uh, some of the concretions in the mud, the ammonites, are truly stunning, beautiful. They're preserved in pyrite and calcite, but again, uncrushed, and again, not found on equivalent sections in the Dorset coast in this state of preservation. Now... Um, going on to one of the stories that uh, I was going to mention uh, is this uh, story of Emily's ammonite. Now, Emily was only five when she found this ammonite. So, so it's a big, uh, re, uh, it's a Rhinechia odysseus. Um, it's got these amazing spines on it. And she was on one of these organised trips that I run, which is for the Cotswold Water Park Trust. And get lots of people coming out and they get a chance to find their own fossils. And she found this um, ammonite. Well, it's a nodule with an ammonite in it, with that. That's just a little plastic spade. <laughs> and she's just poking around in this soft clay, hit something hard. I got called over. I dug a bit of it up, and I thought, wow, you've got something amazing here. And this huge concretion with this, this ammonite. So she was chuffed. Um, the Coastal Water Park Trust, uh, who'd um, managed the trip, they um, contacted the local newspaper and said, this uh, cute five-year-old's found this amazing fossil, um, she's only five, and she was, it was her first field trip. So um, it got into the press. There we are. <laughs> Girl five finds colossal fossil. So um, that was... Uh, so it went viral after that. Yeah, it got tweeted, and, and, and then the national press got interested in it. And then um, it got into the, into the national papers, the Sun, um, Express, you know, various other news, websites, everywhere. And... Uh, and then it um, got on the main news, so um, here's the article. 
And finally, Emily Baldry has achieved something archaeologists dream of. Armed with a plastic spade, and it would seem a bucket full of luck, the six-year-old has unearthed a rare fossil. Now her treasure can be enjoyed by everyone. She has loaned the 160 million-year-old ammonite to a museum. Emily spoke to Helen Callahan about her discovery. Never before has something so old been found by someone so young. But now, six-year-old Emily Baldry can see the rare fossil she dug up with her seaside spade in all its glory. Likes getting mucky. <laughs> Just likes digging. Lots of mud. What were you digging for? This. <laughs> Did you know you'd found this? Mm -mm. It was that. A lump of rock that turned out to be a very rare fossil. The only complete ammonite of its kind in Britain, maybe even northern Europe. The gravel and clay beneath the lakes and quarries here form a window into the past. A treasure trove of fossils dating back to the Ice Age and even earlier to when dinosaurs walked the earth. Emily was on her first organised dig here at the Cotswold Water Park when she struck fossil gold. The paleontologist in charge that day realised it was 160 million years old and very special. To find something in the UK so complete like this is new to science and also it fills a gap in the sort of geological history of this entire area. So what does this pint-sized paleontologist want to find next? More alloy. <laughs> She could be digging a lifetime before she's that lucky again. Helen Callahan, ITV News, Gloucestershire. So there we go. She was only five and on an organised field trip and she found this amazing ammonite. Now, um, Emily's um, ten now and she was on a field trip uh, about three or four months ago. And I said to her, what do you want to be then? She went, I want to be a paleontologist. <laughs> so there we go. Someone inspired by an amazing discovery. And this is the actual ammonite. Now, um, as you can see, it's about um, 40 centimetres across, so it's quite big. And um, it's been on display in the Gateway Centre in the Cotswold Water Park, which is just off the A419. And it is truly remarkable and a very beautiful fossil as well. It's aesthetically quite stunning and rare. There's only been a few specimens of this ammonite found in the UK, and they've all been fragmentary, and a couple in Northern Europe. And this is the first complete specimen of this particular species. Now, this ammonite lives, um, is more common in the tethyan sort of uh, sediments, these sediments that are found in the deeper ocean uh, sort of environments. So this one was probably on his holidays when it ended up in the Boreal Sea uh, over Britain. Um, in terms of um, other sort of muddy uh, adventures, um, let's talk a little bit about Ice Age mud. Um, one of the things that we've turned up from our um, excavations and certainly uh, on, on looking at the Ice Age gravels of these things, um, Paleolithic hand axes, uh, which are coming out abundantly from the gravel pits in the Cotswold Water Park. This is uh, Colm Gravel again as a colleague of mine, Mark O'Dell, looking very pleased with himself, finding, having found this uh, lower Paleolithic hand axe. And that's amazing, you know, you're getting Paleolithic artifacts, you're getting Ice Age bones, you're also getting all these amazing Jurassic uh, fossils from, from the underlying uh, sediments beneath the gravel. So rich and diverse stuff. And uh, again, uh, another five-year-old girl found um, an Ice Age rhinoceros um, uh, in one of the sites that uh, I took a field trip to. And of course, the same thing, uh, Amelia, her name is, and uh, that went viral too. Times older than her. The it belonged to a woolly rhinoceros, which roamed the Cotswolds 50,000 years ago. 50,000 years ago. We know because its remains are still being found today. And some of them have been found by Amelia. Good morning. Good morning. Amelia found a vertebrae bone belonging to a woolly rhino during a walk in the Cotswolds. Yes, it's one of only a handful discovered over the last century. And Amelia. Dad James is here too, and they were on an organised walk in the Cotswold Water Park in Gloucestershire with the paleontologist Neville Hollingworth. Hello. Good morning to you morning. as well. When you made this find, so Amelia, tell us what happened. You were walking around the park looking for things. What happened? Well, there was a bit of it sticking out. A big bit? A little bit? A little bit, and Daddy just thought it was a little pebble, but it was, and it was a. And then Daddy just pulled out of the. And then it 
it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. How did you know? We've got it here. How yeah. did you know that it was something special? How did you know it was something special, Amelia? We didn't know what it was at first. And then when you pulled it out, Dad looked at it and said, "What?" Well, at first I thought we'd found a, a, a well, it looked to me as though it could possibly have been a human pelvis, so I was a bit worried and everything, but luckily Neville was at <laughs> hand to tell us exactly what he thought it was. Mm. And Neville, I mean, how you saw this extraordinary bone yes. found by a five-year-old and thought That's what? That's right. I was quite impressed, actually, because it's very unusual to find woolly rhino bones anyway in the gravel pits. They're not as common as other Ice Age animals, and that it was found by Amelia as well, which is quite spectacular because it was a first fossil hunt as well. So that's a pretty, pretty good start, really. Yeah, your first fossil hunt, Amelia, how long had you been walking and looking before you came across it? Did it feel like a long time, or did you, did you find a it quite quickly? A long time. Yeah. And, and I mean, you must have been so excited that on your first fossil hunt you found a bone. I mean, do you know what a uh, woolly rhinoceros looks like? And how big it is? I... You've got a cuddly toy there, haven't you? That's a cuddly toy version of yeah. the woolly rhinoceros. Yeah, Let's have a look know... at the pictures. Yeah, what are you sorry, oh. Amelia, interrupting. I, I don't know how big they are in actually real, because I've only seen them and they look quite small, but I don't know what they look in real, 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 real life. No, well, let's have a look at what they might have looked in real, real, real life, because this is Walking with Beasts, the BBC programme. So, Neville, just talk us through the woolly rhino and its dimensions. Well, the woolly rhino, uh, unlike its modern descendants, is much bigger than uh, the, the fossil ones. It was about two metres high at the shoulder, probably three to four metres in length, and it was covered with this thick, dense, uh, woolly coat, superbly well adapted for living in a cold climate. And as you can see, it has these two large horns, which, uh, unlike modern uh, rhinos, they have one, these had two. So they were, they were quite fearsome creatures when they were alive, and probably lived a fairly solitary lifestyle. You have previously found uh, an entire skull yes. of the same creature, is that right? Uh, I found a skull of a woolly um, uh, elephant, a, a woolly mammoth, in fact, uh, a few years earlier. And that came from a gravel pit not too far from where this woolly rhinoceros vertebra came from. So quite rich pickings in that particular area. Oh yes, the, the Ice Age gravels in the Cotswold Water Park are a veritable uh, graveyard of um, animals that lived uh, 50,000 years and before that as well. So mm -hmm. it's really quite impressive that Amelia found this on her first trip. James, just tell us when did Amelia get involved with dinosaurs? Is it something that you um, wanted to do and got her interested in? Nothing that I was particularly interested in. I think it all started when Amelia was about two to three years old. And I saw a programme called Lamb Before Time. You saw a programme called Lamb Before Time, yeah, a cartoon for children. Mm -hmm. And then the interest has just spawned from there, really. And she's got a massive collection of dinosaurs, a couple of which she's brought along today. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the reason we went on the hunt, isn't it? And what do you want to do when you're this older, classic. Amelia? Be a paleontologist. You want to be a paleontologist? <laughs> Have you found that more and more youngsters are getting interested in, in dinosaurs now? It seems like they're very... Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, the great thing is it's, it's, it's real. You can go and see these things in museums. You can uh, see fossils in places where they're weathering out cliffs and beaches and on these organised fossil trips. So it's something that anyone can get their hands on. And it's sort of exciting for children to see something that died thousands of years or millions of years ago. And Amelia, why are you interested in fossils? Why should people be interested in fossils and dinosaurs? This is brilliant. Because they were really alive. They were really alive. Well, lovely to meet you, and thank you very much for bringing the bone in. Where does the bone reside now, Neville? It's going to go on display in a, a, a local exhibition centre in the Cotswold Water Park called the Gateway Centre then hopefully in the Corinna Museum in Sirencester for the Science Festival next year. Thank you very much for coming in. Pleasure. Thank you for showing us. You're Thank fine, you. Amelia. Thank Thanks you very much. You. So, I think the moral there is if you're five and you go out on a fossil trip, then you will find something really r remarkable. It's probably because their eyes are a little bit close to the ground. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, anyone of any age can find something really remarkable. And uh, I met, uh, again, on another field trip, um, Amelia uh, is also keen to become a paleontologist a few years later on. So it's just that inspirational moment when you get the chance to find something and then you may wish to carry on 
and follow a career in science and maybe become uh, an earth scientist in your later life. And that's where I find when I do these field trips, people get really excited and interested and inspired by geology and earth science and fossils, although that's the hook, then they may want to go on and study science at a later, later, later career development. So it's, uh, it's something, but they get a lot of fun out of it. People love sort of squelching around in mud. Anyway, um, the other one, the mystery ammonite. This is unusual because this ammonite came from a concretion in the uh, um, Callaway's uh, formation, and we had um, uh, this sort of odd, sort of sort of dark patch in the body chamber, and this is the sutures and the inner wall, and then this is the this is the outer body chamber, which is plugged by sediment. There's this sort of opaque material, and it looks suspiciously like it might be some kind of soft tissue. Now, ammonites there are there are no records or very few records of any ammonites with preserved soft tissue. There are, you find jaw apparatus intact and things like that but not anything with soft tissue. Now, this could potentially have been, by the word been, something that um, had soft tissue uh, preservation. So we, uh, we, we had a look at it, and um, this is what, uh, what we did. We um, uh, sort of tried to map it out, see what there was. You know, there's the sediment fill of the, the body chamber. There's the last suture. There's this, this black blob inside this uh, calcite-filled inner bit. And it looks suspiciously like there was muscle attachment, scars, and all sorts of things. And um, this black material, we did a bit of analysis as well. And so we tried to identify the various bits. They had the, the lower jaw, the anaptychus. We thought we might have stomach material. And the siphuncal, where it's attached to the edge of it, uh, retractor muscles, and so on. So it looked promising. And quick bit of analysis with... Uh, Electron microprobe, calcium phosphate, so it had an organic pre predecessor, so it should just turn to apatite. And so we did a, a little iso um, a CT scan uh, and, and revealed nothing really. Um, <laughs> the, all we found was the, ana the anaptychus, but there was no evidence of the soft tissue or any detail. A beautiful um, it, sort of uh, internal structure of the ammonite. The, um, so that's what we ended up with, what we thought, but there was nothing really to prove until, until somebody came up with an alternative hypothesis. <laughs> okay? So, yeah, you can see the similarities. There's, the, there's the, the broomstick, there's the witch's hat. So, it kind of caught the, it's caught the attention of the press. Okay? So, it got on the Sunday sport. <laughs> so, there we go. <laughs> yep. Witch trapped inside ammonite. Scientists say miracle is not involved. Um, there's a bit of blurb here, but the bit that um, uh, I'll just sort of repeat from the slide. Um, so my colleagues who work with me have now moved institutions several times for, for, for professional reasons. Um, uh, so Dr. Hollingworth's colleague, uh, colleague at Cardiff University, Dr. Churns and Dr. Hilton, who is at the National Museums of Scotland, have been today quoted as saying, well, it looks like a witch if you squint just enough that your eyes are completely shut. <laughs> <laughs> Supporting Dr. Hollingworth's findings in full, uh, the witch hunt continues in full on page 14. But anyway, that's what, what it would have looked like um, should it have had its soft parts preserved. But that was a, an interesting little um, um, possibility, which turned out probably it wasn't actually soft tissue after all, but never mind. Um, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, as they say. But uh, moving up the stratigraphic column, Mammoth Britain, 200,000 years ago, uh, the Ice Age gravels being deposited by the ancient River Thames. Uh, there's a little cartoon there. It's quite fun, amusing, about uh, mammoths being painted on a wall. And um, what... Um, what you can find is lots of loose bones, and they occur at the boundary between the gravels and the underlying Jurassic um, sediments. And you can't help but find mammoth bits and pieces. And on one occasion, we found this beautiful tusk. It was about uh, one and a half, two metres long. Big, big tusk. And this was found in clay, which was like an overbank flood deposit from a, a flood event during the Ice Age when the sediments, these gravels, were being deposited. So we decided, as a team of us from Cardiff, decided to excavate it. We only had a short time. So what we did was we, um, we went to the local, I think it was Wix, and we got some tin foil and we got some expanding foam. You know that stuff in tins you use for filling um, gaps in bricks and, and sealing holes and stuff like that. And so we covered it in tin foil and then we sprayed all this foam all over it. And then we got some MDF shuttering and put it all the way around. And it was a lovely, hot, sunny summer's day in June. And um, 
We thought, well, it's going to take two hours to cure before we can lift it. So we went to the pub, as you do. And so we uh, waited for a couple of hours. Thinking, right, we'll go back. But in the intervening time, um, there was this torrential downpour, this massive thunderstorm. And as I mentioned earlier, these sites are below ground water level. So unfortunately, when we got back, all we found was the foam jacket and the tinfoil floating in this trench. And the, the actual tusk itself had completely disintegrated because the, um, the uh, ivory and the dentine that make it up um, has got no collagen binding it, or very lim little collagen, and it uh, completely disintegrated. So we ended up with a perfect cast, or sorry, a mould of, uh, of the tusk. So, the, so there we were, we were, a very happy mammoth hunter when we found it. But um, as they say, um, the tusk conclusion, or there's a moral here, is that uh, it felt a bit sadly. So the moral of the story is, some tusks are just too big to handle. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. It's, it's bad. It's a bad one. It's a bad one. But anyway, let's move on. So, field trips. Well, um, the Coastal Water Park Trust organise uh, trips to these sites. They're temporary, so they're time limited. They're very popular, and they run two or three a year. And so do Rock Watch as well. And uh, I've run trips for them as well with Susan Brown. And they're very popular too because people get an opportunity to find fossils for themselves, collect and they can keep what they find. And here, this one here is particularly interesting because this is the quenny digging for families. And so you get a, like a, a tape line and then they can just dig along this, stretch, this straight section here. And people found lots and lots of amazing ammonites. They're really, really chuffed. And, and the great thing is you can dig in mud and you get muddy and um, it's all fun. And it's better than being on your Xbox or on your iPad because you're out in the field and you never know what you're going to find. So it inspires and it enthuses and it motivates. And, you know, you, you'd be there from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon and you never get bored. That's really, really quite good. But just as uh, I'll be finishing very shortly, but... Um, I'll um, just um, bring you your attention to something that's uh, recently um, um, taking, well, it's taken place. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this well-known newspaper, The Toad. Um, it's uh, The Toad, all the crap that's unfit to print. Um, and um, this is uh, taken from a recent paleontological convention. I'll just read it out quickly. Um, it says, Members of the World Paleontologists Association yesterday agreed unanimously to donate their bodies to the fossil record, thereby hoping to increase study material for future paleontologists. The one thing we can do, well, we all agree on, is that there simply aren't enough fossils to go round, explained Professor Black to a packed conference in Phoenix yesterday. And if we can somehow ensure a better supply of hominid remains to our descendants in a million or so years, we will have made a significant contribution to the science. The notoriously patchy fossil record of early hominids has been something of a problem in recent years, with complete skeletons and even large sections of cranial bone missing or non-existent. With the new fossil record donor card, this, can, or, this is all set to change. It is the paleontologist's responsibility to take active steps to ensure their own fossilisation, continued Professor Black, handing out the small plastic donor cards yesterday. As a card holder nears death, they should insist they be removed to a warm, shallow sea and, upon expiration, be covered almost instantly by a heavy layer of sediment. If a shallow sea is impractical, a list of tar pits will be made available from my office. <laughs> Those that favour alluvial preservation will be encouraged to leap into a river in a flood a few hundred yards upstream from a slow bend. So the system looks set to be enthusiastically picked up, not least because a prize will be offered to those most perfectly preserved with special merit certificates for maintaining an uncrushed cranium or preserved soft tissues. Um, I've got a bunch of fossil donor cards if anybody's interested after my uh, talk finishes. So, to finish... What happened to the dinosaurs?
So there we go. It was methane after all. Thank you very much. <laughs>